Hello, I'm Dr. Matthew Matasar, a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Welcome to this program entitled, Exploring Novel Approaches with PI3K Inhibitors in Relapsed or Refractory Follicular and Marginal Zone Lymphoma. In this segment of the program, I will be discussing emerging treatment approaches to PI3K inhibition. I'll start us off in the segment by a discussion of the medicine Zandelisib, formerly known as ME401, in the treatment of follicular lymphoma. As shown here, the initial work evaluating Zandelisib looked at the use of this medicine as monotherapy in the treatment of relapsed or refractory follicular lymphoma in second-line therapy or beyond. In this study, it was used either as monotherapy or in combination with rituximab. The dosing schedule of Zandelisib is different than that that had been previously evaluated in the use of oral PI3K inhibitors, where instead of using chronic oral daily administration, two cycles of loading dose at a daily basis were given, followed by a more maintenance fashion of giving the medicine weekly for one week on and then three weeks off until progression or intolerance. Based on characters of the patients treated with a median of two prior lines of therapy and everybody having received prior anti-CD20 antibody therapy, with a median follow-up of over one year, we see an overall response rate in treated patients of 83%. 22% of patients achieving a complete response, and the median duration of remission at the time of this reporting not yet having been achieved. Furthermore, toxicity appears to be better than that which we had previously experienced with oral PI3K inhibitors, including low rates of diarrhea, enteritis, hepatitis, and pneumonitis. Results have been further updated by Dr. Pagel at the most recent ASCO, with a particular focus on patients who had failed to uh, not progress within 24 months of initial diagnosis, so-called POD24 failures. And Dr. Pagel reports that the results with Zandelisib are good both in the overall treated population as well as in that higher risk subset of patients who were POD24 with very high overall response rates uh, regardless of POD24 status. The low rates of severe toxicity were confirmed in this update. And indeed, we see long progression-free survival and duration of response with a median PFS in the POD24 patients of 12 months and for the non-POD24 not yet having been reached and duration of response in both groups exceeding 15 months. Work trying to confirm these early promising results with Zendelisib is being conducted in an ongoing fashion in the TIDAL study using ME401 monotherapy, Zendelisib monotherapy, at the schedule as we've previously discussed. And this will be an internationally conducted trial for patients with either follicular or marginal zone lymphoma. Moving on to the next novel PI3K inhibitor, parsiclisib. We see here the Citadel 203 study, the first of two studies that we will address briefly today. This one evaluating its use in relapsed follicular lymphoma in the third line or beyond. Originally, two different dosing schedules were being evaluated after a two-month loading schedule, as we saw with Zandelisib, followed by either once weekly administration or low-dose oral daily administration. And indeed, it was the low-dose oral daily administration that was continued, dropping the weekly plan. Overall response rates with parsiclisib were high, with 73% overall response rate, 14% of whom were a CR. And these results were very similar in the oral group that was expanded subsequently. Shown here are progression-free survival and duration of response. And at a median follow-up, as shown here, we see that the median progression-free survival was over 15 months for all valuable patients, as well as the daily treated patients. And duration of response approaching 15 months in both groups as well. Toxicity-wise, parsiclisib does appear to be somewhat different than that which we saw with zandelisib, with somewhat higher rates of diarrhea, 33% overall, 10% grade 3 or greater, as well as moderate hematologic toxicity. That being said, pneumonitis was rare, and severe hepatitis was uncommonly reported, only two cases of grade 3 or greater ALT elevation. The sister to study to 203 is the Citadel 204 study evaluating parsiclisib monotherapy in marginal zone lymphoma, here as second line therapy or beyond. A similar dosing strategy was pursued, looking at both the weekly maintenance or chronic low dose oral daily maintenance with again, daily being selected. There was a second early lead in cohort of patients who had been previously treated with uh, ibrutinib and this cohort was closed early on. For the BTK naive patients, you see the early results summarized down the bottom with an achieved overall response rate regardless of subtype of marginal zone lymphoma, nodal, extranodal, and splenic, uh, above 50%. And this includes patients that were either relapsed following most recent line of therapy or who had been refractory to the most recent line of therapy. Complete response rates, however, were low. In looking at progression-free survival and duration of response, we see that the PFS for all treated patients was 19 months, 
And for those that did respond, the median duration of response is 12 months um, so far in the all treated patients. Daily is not yet reached, although you can see from the Kaplan-Meier curves that it very much brushes down to that 0 0.5 threshold at a time similar to that for the overall treated cohort. Toxicity for the marginal zone lymphoma treated patients is quite similar to that which we saw in follicular lymphoma with moderate rates of diarrhea, 44% overall and 11% grade three, but again, low rates of pneumonitis or hepatitis. For those patients who did have diarrhea, the onset usually occurred around five months in at median while they're in the chronic oral daily low dose administration. And with dose delay and adjustment, we see that the median time to improvement was under two weeks. However, in the overall treated patient group and the daily group, we saw that between a quarter and a third of patients did require discontinuation due to a treatment emergent adverse event. Moving to the next agent, copamlicib, unlike parsiclicib or zandelicib, this is an intravenously administered pan-PI3K inhibitor with selective activity against the alpha and delta isoforms. And Professor Zinzani updated the results from Kronos 3 at the most recent EHA. As a reminder, C3 was a study comparing the use of copanlicib plus rituximab versus rituximab plus placebo in patients with relapsed indolent B-cell lymphomas who were rituximab sensitive, either 12 months from their last rituximab-based therapy or six months from their last therapy, but unfit or unwilling to receive chemotherapy. The results confirmed the previously published uh, findings for the use of copanlicib in this context combined with rituximab with improvement in overall progression-free survival from 14 months for placebo plus rituximab to 21.5 months for the combination therapy at a median follow-up of 19 months. And this was highly statistically significant. Looking at the follicular lymphoma subset of patients, we saw improvement in PFS from just over 18 months to 22 months. And in margins on lymphoma, perhaps a greater improvement from 11.5 months for placebo plus rituximab to 22 months for the combination with copanlicin. When we look at both complete and overall response rates across the indolent B-cell lymphoma spectrum, we see improvements with the combination, both overall as well as by individual histologic subtypes, with the possible exception of lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma Waldenstrom's, where, where the improvement, while measurable, was not statistically significant, perhaps due to the smaller number of patients treated with this histologic subtype. The safety profile of combination therapy was comparable to what we would expect from copanlicib or rituximab as monotherapies. Copanlicib, due to it, in part due to its uh, PI3K alpha inhibition, has well characterized, although transient, uh, hypertension and hyperglycemia associated with its infusion. Although there was concern regarding risk of pneumonitis for combination of CD20 antibody therapy with a PI3K inhibitor, thankfully we did not see high rates of pneumonitis in patients treated with combination therapy overall only 7% of patients, and few of these were grade three or greater. Copanlicib is being further evaluated in Kronos 4. This trial has completed its accrual and we are awaiting data readout. This study looks at the combination of chemoimmunotherapy, either BR or R-CHOP, plus copanlicib versus placebo in patients with relapsed indolent B-cell lymphoma in the second line or beyond. The idea being that patients, if they had received a CVP or CHOP-like therapy previously, would go on to receive BR with or without capanlicib, or if they'd been treated with Benda previously, receive RCHOP with or without capanlicib. Combination therapy is given as induction, and then there's consolidation for completing two years with capanlicib versus placebo. Ongoing evaluation with zandelicib is being pursued in combination with xanabrutinib, which is a, an oral BTK inhibitor. In this combination therapy, we have early data readout looking at the combination. We see that there is clear toxicity from combining PI3K with BTK, as we would expect, regardless of that, we did see rates of hepatitis higher with the more uh, high dose induction strategy, but rates of ALT and ST elevation were significant in both treatment cohorts. That being said, we do see clear activity across the spectrum of B-cell lymphoma, both indolent and aggressive, uh, that were evaluated. In the indolent patients, including follicular, CLL, marginal zone, and mantle cell, we had an overall response rate for this combination of 100% albeit in a small number of treated patients to date. Zandelicib is further being evaluated in combination with rituximab, and the Zandelicib plus rituximab combo is being compared to standard immunochemotherapy, either BOR or RCHOP, in the treatment of patients with relapsed indolent lymphoma, either follicular or marginal zone, in the second line or beyond. Hopefully this will give us some greater insight into the utility and safety of PI3K inhibition with Zandelicib earlier on in the treatment course of patients with indolent B-cell lymphomas. An agent that we haven't had time to fully explore in terms of the ongoing clinical development of it 
is that of umbralisib, which is another oral PI3K inhibitor that has been FDA approved as monotherapy in the treatment of relapsed inner lymphomas. And the ongoing UNITY trials are comparing the use of umbralisib in a number of clinical settings combined with ublituximab, which is a novel CD20 antibody therapy with or without bendamustine, as well as ongoing work looking at umbralisib alone and with other partners in the treatment of indolent lymphomas. And we look forward to learning more about the safety and effectiveness of umbralisib combination therapy in the months and years to come. Ultimately, the question we're asking ourselves within the lymphoma community is this, is there a potential for the use of pediatric inhibitors to move earlier in the treatment paradigm because we have these novel agents with due to either greater specificity, less off-target effect, and novel dosing strategies, we have agents that appear to be as or more effective with fewer toxicities. And this opens the door to thinking about novel combination therapy, which can lead to greater efficacy with limited toxicity. This is the hope of the future of PI3K inhibition. And I look forward to sharing these data with you as they emerge over the years to come. Thank you for participating in this activity. Please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation.